let's get started uh, we have uh, iteration today which is a really exciting as well as challenging chapter right here and uh, what this uh, basically talks about is uh, it it has like two uh, major parts uh, in, in which the iteration is divided one uh, part of it deals with uh, loops uh, the for loop and uh, different uh, scenarios in which we can uh, apply a for loop and then the second half of the chapter talks about the per package and uh, the map uh, so it's a pretty heavy chapter and i thought it would be best if we take it piecemeal uh, so what i propose to do today is to uh, uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, the for loops and uh, for loops versus uh, functionals and kind of introduce the idea of the advantages of uh, the per package over uh, uh, over traditional loops and then leave it at that today uh, let things settle down and then pick up uh, the map functions in detail uh, next week does does that sound okay to everyone yeah sounds good all right uh, so yeah this would mean that we uh, would get get delayed by one more week so uh, before we can start uh, with the models part but as i was going through this chapter i felt that this is this is something that it it needs uh, it needs uh, time and uh, I, I think going over it in two weeks would kind of consolidate uh, the learnings that we can get from it. Uh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So yeah, so I think the way that this chapter is outlined is that it uh, kind of introduces the idea of why we would want uh, to iterate over uh, different uh, functions and introduces the for loops and then goes into the ideas of uh, uh, of for loops versus functionals. And functionals is something that we would uh, look at uh, pretty soon. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll not get into that detail right now. Uh, but after that, it kind of uh, talks about the map. Uh, it, uh, it, it kind of talks about the map functions and, uh, and kind of uh, gives us a lot of information and a lot of tips on how to deal with failures, how can we map over multiple arguments and stuff like that. Uh, so without further ado, I'll jump right into it. Uh, so the two main ways uh, through which we can reduce code duplication uh, are functions and iterations. We have been talking about functions in the past weeks and we saw that functions can uh, reduce code duplication to a huge extent. Uh, we can write one function and it helps us in uh, kind of uh, having a having a single go to place where uh, we can edit, update the function. We do not need to repeat uh, the same lines of code again and again, and it kind of makes our life uh, a lot easier. Uh, but then a second way to reduce code duplication is iterations. And iterations are specifically useful when we need to do the same thing on multiple uh, inputs. For example, we want to repeat the same operation on different columns or on different data sets. Uh, these are examples where iterations are uh, specifically very, very useful. And uh, there are two main iteration paradigms that the book uh, introduces right away. And these paradigms are uh, imperative programming and functional programming. So imperative programming, uh, from what I understood was, is something that uh, makes uh, the iteration very obvious. So, so the way that the code is written, it's very obvious that we are uh, kind of trying to repeat uh, things over and over again. And, and uh, examples of imperative uh, iterations are loops where we right away start the loop by saying that, okay, for i uh, goes from whatever, one to n, uh, repeat the following uh, the following function or the following uh, activity. Uh, so so that, that I mean, the, the line where we say for or 
the line where we introduce a while uh, kind of makes it very imperative uh, uh, kind of kind of puts it out front that we are going to iterate over uh, multiple columns or multiple data sets and that's why it's called imperative programming uh, in contrast uh, functional programming doesn't make it as obvious that we are uh, kind of going to iterate but it's much more compact much more comprehensive and it if it further reduces the duplicity that uh, arises or that's present in imperative programming and we'll we'll soon see uh, the kind of duplicity or the kind of verbosity that uh, imperative programming uh, kind of brings in so that's about uh, the the broad kind of uh, the, the two broad paradigms of iteration and uh, today we'll basically be talking about imperative uh, programming. We'll be talking about for loops at quite uh, some length, uh, and we'll uh, we'll touch upon uh, some ideas of functional programming, but most of it would be uh, left for uh, the next week. Uh, so we'll start with a basic example. Let's say that we have this data set right here with four columns uh, and ten rows. Uh, and let's say we want to compute the medium for uh, each of the columns. Uh, one way to do that is to simply say median uh, DFA, uh, which would give us the medium of the column A. Uh, but then in order to get the medium for all the columns, we'll have to repeat it four times. Uh, and there would be a lot of copy paste if you want to avoid. Uh, we can avoid uh, this uh, repeated copy pasting by uh, simply using a uh, for loop. Uh, and uh, this is a very basic example of a for loop. And uh, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, an overlay of its structure as well. So we start by defining uh, an output space, uh, which, is a, which is a vector that contains a double type uh, of uh, elements. And it has the same number of columns as the data set that we have, df. And uh, the next line of the code is the sequence, uh, which says that for i uh, in sequence along df, which means from i goes from one to uh, the number of columns that uh, our data set has, uh, output of i is, uh, takes the value of uh, median of df of i. So i will take the value of one, two, three, and four. And for each of the iterations, our output would, would store uh, the median of, of that particular column in which the sequence is uh, at its current iteration. And when we print this output, we see that it is kind of uh, kind of generating all, all uh, the four medians that we had required and it kind of uh, it reduces our need to copy paste and therefore uh, uh, makes us prone to errors. So this is this is the basic structure of a for loop. And as we see here, it has three basic elements. And uh, these three basic elements are nothing but the output, the sequence, and the body. This is, I mean, in any for loop, these, these three uh, elements would always be uh, present. Uh, the output is nothing but a space or, or, a, or, a, or, or kind of a, uh, uh, an object that uh, allows us to create space uh, before starting the for loop or before starting any loop to store our outputs. Uh, so it's always advisable to create or to have that kind of a space allocated beforehand rather than trying to grow that space uh, while we are uh, in a for loop, so so this is uh, this is the first step uh, when we are trying to create a for loop. Uh, the second line is uh, very critical and it's almost uh, uh, always present in all loops, uh, which is the sequence, uh, and it determines what are we trying to loop over. Uh, in our case, we were trying to loop from one to the number of columns that our data frame we have had. And uh, this is exactly what it's doing. It's uh, uh, by simply writing for uh, parenthesis i in sequence along df, uh, it's kind of instructing the iteration to go from one to the number of columns that df has. 
and finally the body of the loop is is, is uh, where the meat is uh, which kind of instructs uh, the iteration uh, on what to do at each of the items. So for each value of i, what do we want to store in the output that we have previously uh, defined? Uh, so those are the three basic elements of any for loop. And irrespective of however long our for loop is or however complicated our for loop is, these three elements are always going to be uh, present. And these are, these are the only three elements that we need to be that we need to uh, kind of develop while creating a for loop. Uh, the book kind of draws a very, very fine distinction between uh, sequence along uh, versus saying one to length L. So I think uh, the way that we, at least I uh, was introduced to for loops uh, was that we used to write that for I goes from I for i goes from 1 to let's say 10 and it would uh, iterate from 1 to 10. Uh, and here I think uh, in R uh, we could have done a similar thing. We could have simply written that for i goes from uh, for i in 1 to length of a df or for i in length of or simply 4. Uh, the uh, book kind of advises against using length and uh, prefers sequence along over the use of length. And that's because uh, sequence along has this advantage over, uh, over length as seen here. So if let's say we have a zero length vector, which we have defined here as y, uh, if we uh, sequence along y, it kind of returns the right result. It says that it's an integer of zero length. Uh, whereas if we, uh, if we kind of go from, or if, if we use uh, for i uh, in one to length of y, it starts from y, it's, it starts from one and then goes to zero saying that, okay, this is, so so, it, so, it, so, so one is always going to be the starting point if we uh, imperatively define uh, that the iteration should go from one to length of x. So this might create a lot of problems in our for loops and, uh, that's why it's always safer to use sequence along instead of uh, length of x in our while well defined by loops. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's a bit about the structure of a for loop. And uh, then there are a couple of different variations that uh, the book gets into. And there are four primary uh, variations that we need to consider uh, that we can, and these are kind of use case scenarios that we can use uh, a for loop for. Uh, so the first iteration is to modify an exist existing object instead of creating a new object. So we already have, let's say a data frame and we want to modify all the columns of that data frame. Or we already have a vector and we want to modify all the elements. We'll, we'll look at an example of that. Uh, the second use case is uh, looping over names or values instead of so uh, in the previous example, we saw that we were looping over a uh, sequence of uh, or sequence along uh, the DF, which is basically looping over all the indices or uh, all the indices that correspond to the uh, number of columns that the data frame had. But there might well be a use case where we wanted to loop over names instead of uh, indices. So that's another uh, useful scenario where loops might be very useful for us. And we'll, we'll also see an example of that. And uh, the next uh, use case is to, uh, in cases where we have to handle outputs of unknown length. So we don't know how long our output is going to grow. Uh, what do we do in uh, scenarios like that? How do we handle, handle that is another use case. And the fourth one is how to handle sequences of unknown length. So for example, if we do not know how many times uh, we need to iterate, uh, so that's another use case that uh, we can address using a for loop and we'll also see in uh, the example. Uh, so we'll now talk about the first use case, which is to modify an existing object instead of creating a new object. Uh, to do that, let's go back to our, uh, to the example data set that we were looking at, uh, four columns, uh, 10 uh, rows each. 
and uh, let's say we wanted to rescale all the columns of the database uh, and rescale is something that we looked at the uh, functions in the functions chapter uh, where we had defined this new function called rescale 01 and we use the range function to kind of uh, uh, calculate the range and then uh, take the difference between the ranges of the denominator and the difference between each element and the minimum value of that range as the numerator and kind of rescale it based on that. Uh, now this function is extremely useful. The only thing is that if we wanted to rescale all of the columns uh, of this data frame df, uh, what we would need to do is to kind of uh, call this function again and again. So dfa is this and dfb is this and dfc is this. Uh, however, as we saw that we can always uh, use uh, iteration, so we can always use a for loop uh, instead of calling this function multiple times. And uh, this is a good example where we want to modify all the elements of this data frame. And we do that by calling, uh, uh, by, by using the for loop, uh, by iterating over the number of columns that we have in the data frame, which is four. And then uh, saving the vats and then calling the rescale uh, function for each of the elements of the data, data frame. Uh, we saw in, in our uh, chapter on lists that uh, df double brackets i would call the first element of, uh, uh, of, of the uh, data frame, which is the first column of the data frame. And then it would store uh, the value in the first element as the first element of the df. So when we uh, call dfa now, uh, previously it gave us uh, these 10 uh, numbers that we have created using the r norm function. Uh, but now when we call dfa, it kind of uh, has rescaled all of these elements and uh, we see the we see that all of, all of the uh, uh, all of the elements have now been uh, kind of rescaled based on uh, the function rescale zero one. So so yeah, this is this is uh, a really simple and basic example of how we can use for loops to uh, to kind of modify an existing data frame. Here we see that all the elements of the data frame and in all of the columns were uh, modified based on uh, the rescale function. And uh, two things to note here is that one, we very conveniently used uh, a function, a predefined function within the for loop. So this is a really great uh, example there, uh, which kind of uh, tells us that we can easily wrap a for loop around the predefined function. Uh, so that, that kind of makes our life, uh, lives much more easier. And uh, also uh, uh, another thing to note is the use of the double brackets uh, within the for loop instead of the single brackets, which kind of uh, uh, makes sense here because we are trying to uh, change each element uh, within the data frame and uh, the authors also recommend using double breaks uh, whenever we are uh, using or working on a single element because it just uh, clarifies uh, that uh, straight up. So with those two notes, I think we uh, kind of uh, are, we kind of looked at the example where we were modifying an existing object. And the next, uh, and we kind of proceed to the next uh, use case where uh, we are looping over patterns. Yeah, so we are, we kind of look at uh, looping patterns and there are three general ways to uh, loop over a vector. The first we have already seen where we were looping using indices. Uh, we uh, kind of specified that for i in sequence along the data frame or sequence along some other vector. And that's the first way of uh, looping over a vector. And then there are two other ways of looping over uh, a vector. Uh, the second way is looping over the elements using uh, something like this. So, so for x in xs. So, so note the use of uh, so instead of uh, instead of using uh, sequence along, we are uh, supplying the whole 
like a vector of uh, elements and uh, this uh, would be useful when we care only about the side effects for example we care about uh, plotting or saving a function uh, saving a file uh, the author said say that uh, saving output effectively is difficult in this case and the third way to loop over uh, a vector is to looping is to is to uh, loop over names uh, and uh, here we uh, use for for nm in names of excess instead of using excess directly so this gives us names uh, which we can again access using the two double brackets uh, x double bracket nm and this is useful uh, when we are using name in a plot type or a file. Um, yeah, uh, let me just quickly look if we have an example that we can. Yeah, uh, so uh, for looping over uh, names and looping over elements, uh, there are two examples. One is uh, where we have this vector called results, and then we are uh, kind of, we have X defined somewhere else, uh, and we kind of store the names of the results uh, based on the values of the names of the vector x and then we also have iteration over numeric indices uh, which in the um, this is a very general uh, form of using it where we are simply using i in sequence along x uh, and then we are storing uh, the names of each elements of x uh, in this vector name and then we are storing the values of uh, each of these elements uh, x uh, i's uh, in, in, in another output uh, uh, that that takes takes uh, the name of value. So this this is one way through which we can loop over names, or we can loop over uh, elements uh, instead of looping along uh, sequences that we are very familiar with. So just to keep that in our back pockets. And uh, then we move to the third use case scenario, which was uh, uh, cases where we have an unknown output length. So here we do not know how long our output is going to be. For example, if we want to simulate some random vectors of random length. Uh, so one way to solve this problem would be to uh, progressively grow uh, to progressively keep growing this vector and, uh, and an example of this is that let's say we have a vector uh, called means uh, with values 0 1 and 2 and then we uh, kind of create this uh, empty vector output and uh, we iterate over all the elements of means and uh, sample and store uh, like one value uh, in n and then uh, store uh, kind of add uh, uh, or sort of append uh, like a random distribution of uh, n and means i in, uh, on top of that output. So this can keep growing uh, as we can see when we are looking at the structure of this output, this can be uh, quite a long uh, vector. Uh, however, this doing this is not very efficient as at each iteration R has to copy the data from all the previous iterations and it can uh, become computationally demanding very soon. Uh, so a better way to deal with this could be to uh, use for loops, but to store uh, the results in a list. So instead of uh, creating an output uh, which is a double vector, we create an output that is, a, that is a list and the length of the list is equal to the length of uh, the, the vector means that we had uh, we, uh, uh, were given uh, to start with. 
and then we iterate over uh, all the elements of means and uh, kind of perform the same uh, same uh, or, or a similar uh, uh, line of code in the body and then uh, print the structure of and printing the structure of out uh, would then give us uh, these three different and distinct uh, elements of of the list that we have created and then we can flatten the list by using unlist uh, which would give us uh, these 158 uh, vectors so doing this is far more uh, efficient than uh, being completely blank about uh, the total number of uh, elements that our output is going to have and creating like this blank uh, or this empty uh, vector and letting it go to, to whatever number is, is going to take. So that is another interesting use case uh, where we do not know how long our output is going to be, and it's always advisable to use a list over uh, use a list within a for loop uh, rather than creating a creating a flat vector uh, right away. And uh, finally, we have. Uh, the last use case scenario, which was uh, to have, which was cases where we have an unknown sequence uh, length. So we do not know what is the length of our sequence, what is how how long we should uh, we should have the we should let the sequence run. And a good example of this is uh, uh, when we want our our iteration to loop until we get three heads in a row. Now this is this totally depends on chance. We do not know how long it would take for us for a coin for a kind of a, a series of coin flips to have three heads in a row. However, we can achieve it using uh, a, a for loop uh, where uh, uh, sorry sorry we cannot achieve it using a for loop because we do not know the exact sequence of uh, of a. Of, of, of we do not know the exact length of the sequence that we want uh, the iterations uh, to occur. Uh, however, we can use a while loop to achieve this. And uh, while loop has a slightly different structure than the for loop. In a while loop, we uh, we specify a condition uh, that has to be met. Uh, and uh, at the moment that the condition is not met, the loop stops uh, iterating. Uh, we can, uh, as a thumb rule, it's important to know that we can rewrite any for loop as a while loop, uh, but we can't write every while loop as a for loop. Uh, an example of this is an example of doing the first where we can rewrite any for loop as a while loop uh, is going back to our examples where we said that for i in sequence along x, we, we had a body uh, of codes. Uh, which is equivalent to, to assigning i equals one and then saying while i less than equals to the length of x. So, and then within the body of the loop, we kind of uh, keep growing the value of i by one units per uh, interaction. So this would keep on repeating. So, so the one will become two and the two will become three until uh, the value of i uh, reaches the length of x. So we see that it's easy to uh, rewrite a for loop into a while loop. So, so basically uh, creating a condition out of the sequence uh, of X. However, it would be difficult to convert a condition into a sequence, uh, just as we saw in the, in the previous, in the, in the problem that we are given. Uh, the problem is that we need to need the iteration to loop until we have three consecutive heads uh, in point. Now there's no way of us knowing how long would it take. So there's no way for us to convert this kind of a condition into a sequence that we can then pass on to uh, a for loop. So this is a good heuristic for us to know that we can rewrite a for loop uh, as a while loop, but we can't write, uh, we can't rewrite a while loop as a for loop. Uh, and to go come back to our example of three heads, uh, we can achieve that uh, by using a while loop, and this is how it's working. Uh, this would basically give us different results, uh, different times. We do not have, we do not have a set seed, 
uh, but basically we are creating a function where we are sampling either a either a tails or a head uh, and then we are uh, creating two uh, objects one is a flip one is called flips and then the second one is number of heads both of which have a value of zero to begin with and uh, we start our while loop by saying while n heads is uh, sorry uh, uh yeah so while n heads is less than three uh and uh, within the body of that loop we say that okay if uh flip is equals to h so flip is the function that we have created so if flip uh, which is sampling either a tail or a head if that's a head the the value of n heads uh, goes from n heads plus one so it, it starts from zero uh, if it gets uh, a head, it would become a one. If it gets another head, it would become a two. If it gets another head, it would become a three. And uh, once it kind of uh, it becomes more than two, or, or kind of is, uh, whenever the value of uh, until the value of uh, n heads is less than three, it keeps on iterating uh, this loop. Uh, Whenever we do not have two consecutive heads, it kind of uh, changes the value of n heads back to zero. So it's back to square one. The number of the value of n heads is zero again, and then we start all over again. And outside uh, of this if condition, we are we kind of uh, keep on increasing the value of flips by one. And whenever this condition is met, we print the value of flips. So in my example, we I was able to achieve. Uh, three consecutive heads in six iterations, but yeah, when I was like playing around with this code, it, it, it you know there was a time when it took like twenty, I think seventeen iterations. So it, it can it it can take whatever number of iterations it takes to have three heads. In a row. It totally depends on the random chance. So this is a really good example of using a while loop, and the important thing and the important distinction for us to keep in mind is that. A while loop is based on a condition. Uh, so whenever the condition is met, uh, the while loop runs as long as soon as the condition doesn't is not met, it kind of stops running. Uh, as against a for loop, which always has this very specific number of uh, iterations that it could run. It all so given a value of sequence along x, uh, it would always run a specific number of times. Uh, uh, as compared to while loop, which can uh, which can be coded to run uh, until a particular condition is met. So this is a really good way and a really good example of uh, cases where we might have to generate a loop uh, when we do not know the exact uh, sequence. Uh, so that uh, brings us to uh, the close of the four uh, different use case scenarios that we talked about uh, while using loops. And slowly we are moving into the direction of, uh, of, of comparing loops with functionals and, uh, and, and then the book kind of uh, takes a deeper dive into functions. Uh, for us, Today, I think we will just, this is kind of a teaser for us where we are just looking at uh, comparing loops versus functionals and uh, uh, gives us a little bit of food for thought for what is coming up next. So uh, for uh, loops, uh, so the for loops are not as important uh, in R because it's a functional programming language. Uh, we can wrap up uh, we can wrap a for loop in a function as we saw and kind of call that function. Uh, the book gives us this example of uh, a case where we wanted to compute the mean uh, of each column uh, in the same data set that we are just working on. So we can achieve this by uh, kind of creating uh, this function and this function is wrapped around our for loop uh, so in our for loop, the main body is kind of creating, uh, is kind of uh, uh, calling the mean function and uh, and iterating over all the columns. So whenever we call this function, we can get the mean of each of the columns uh, within the dataset uh, by virtue of having this for loop 
uh, embedded within the function. Uh, what happens is that when we call this function on our data frame, it kind of gives us the mean values of all the four columns that we present in, in uh, but what happens if we realize that we also want to compute the median as well? So we want the mean, uh, but now we are interested in the median for each of the columns as well. Now it's it's similar. We can we can easily write a similar function uh, wrap around a similar for loop, uh, and the only change would be to swap uh, median uh, by mean. Uh, but that would be, you know, copying and pasting. So uh, we'll, we'll have to simply copy paste this code again, and we'll have to replace the mean with the median. But the question next arises that, okay, what if we wanted a standard deviation? What if we wanted some other uh, summary function? Uh, and we soon realized that uh, this is not super optimal because uh, we, while we have like this really elegant way of wrapping a function around uh, a for loop, uh, but we still will have to write or we, we still will have to kind of uh, call this code and you know uh, define this function again and again for each of the each of the summary functions that we want now uh, the beauty of uh, of of uh, loops and functions in r is that we can actually define a function uh, that takes a function as an argument which is which is really powerful so we can create a function called uh, we can create a function called column summary, uh, which takes two arguments. One is the data frame and the second is uh, a, a, a value of a function. And uh, what it does is it creates this output of uh, an output uh, vector that has uh, a data structure of double. And uh, we are uh, iterating it uh, through the sequence of uh, of the number of columns that this data frame has, and we are storing the uh, uh, the, uh, the the value of the function called on each of the columns of the data frame into the output vector that we just defined. Now, the beauty of writing this code is that we can simply replace this function by anything, right? We can simply call uh, column summary df median, and it would generate uh, the medians of all the four columns in the data frame. Uh, we can uh, simply call uh, column summary df and mean, and instead of computing a median, it would now give us the means of all the four columns. And we can simply replace mean by standard deviation, and it would uh, give us the standard deviation of all the four columns. So this is really powerful, I felt. Uh, it, it reduces uh, our need to kind of uh, being verbose and kind of copying our codes uh, multiple number of times and uh, makes the code look really elegant. So this is uh, the uh, the main difference between for loops and functionals, and uh, and and this is where the book kind of gives us the idea and kind of introduces us to the third package. Uh, uh, saying that you know passing functions onto other functions is a really powerful idea. It's, it's really useful. Makes for really compact codes. Uh, uh, the apply family does uh, quite a bit of that. Uh, so the apply, l apply, and p apply uh, functions can do quite a bit of that. But they lack consistency. So they have different uh, structures uh, uh, that are returned, and they take different arguments. Uh, the per package, uh, on the other hand, is much more consistent, and uh, and there are two main goals of the per function. The first one is that how can we solve the problem of for a single element of the list? Once you have solved that problem, per takes care of generalizing your solution to every element of the list. So it's kind of uh, it, it works on the uh, heuristic of you know. That you know, we break down the problem, we solve it for one element, and once we have figured out how to uh, how to solve the problem for one element, we can then generalize it to the larger uh, list. And yeah, it's it's all about breaking a complex problem into bit-sized pieces, uh, and it allows us to uh, kind of advance uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, that and it works really well with uh, the Python. So 
yeah, so so all of these features, the consistency, its ability to break down complex problems into smaller pieces, and uh, uh, and yeah, and and allowing us to advance in a piece by piece, in a piecemeal manner, kind of gives us a lot of advantages of using the Perl package. Uh, and yeah, that's it. That's that's like a small teaser for uh, this package. I'm really excited to dive. Uh, deeper into it, and we'll talk about uh, this package uh, in detail next week. So, thank you for being so patient. And uh, if you would like like to share any thoughts, any suggestions on using loops, any any pro tips, or any experiences of using the apply or the full package, that would be really uh, helpful for me as I think about the next part of the chapter. Thanks, Arnab. That was a great intro. Um, I found some, uh, there was this R Studio training, like one of those R Studio workshops on per package uh, to our, uh, which I caught after, um, like after the event. But that was very useful. I will share that in the chat, uh, in on Slack, um, in terms of like getting a, beyond reading the book like getting a hang of uh yeah. the iterations so i'll share that if that's useful but we yeah, are really looking forward to the next um presentation i i feel like iteration is just so so useful and yeah it totally deserves as much time we can spend on it yeah yeah i, I mean any extra reading would be helpful because i i went to the description of the of the core package and the map functions and uh, it's it's really i I'm, I'm pretty sure it would take us a while to get our heads around it yeah so yeah different yeah. different ways of uh, or different ways of presenting it would certainly help in reinforcing what we're learning so thanks yeah sure All right. Uh, it's just us on the call. Okay, great. <laughs> so I think Mol Molik dropped uh, dropped out. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, great then. Um, see you next week. See you next week. Thanks so much for dropping by. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.